You are now listening to Aging Wisely, the podcast. Thank you for pressing play and joining me. I am Veronica Escobar, the creator, producer, and host. Every two weeks, I will bring you a person, organization, issue, or story that centers the lives and needs of the aging and disabled communities. My hope for you is education and transformation. Meet Brian Connolly, a proud native of New Jersey and a married father of four young children. He is also a veteran disability services professional. Just a bit of background. I met his wife when we were both college freshmen at Fordham University. They met our last week of college when Brian was finishing up his junior year and we, his future wife and I, were literally out the door. I was a guest at their wedding and over the years have watched their family grow. I think they're perfect together, but this episode isn't about that. In this episode, you'll learn about his career journey and what shaped it. It happened early on and is quite personal. You'll also get an inside view into his profession and the challenges faced by the families and the professionals who serve them. When I was in college at Fordham, I had an internship at the Department of Commerce. There was a gentleman at the office that had worked there for many years, and he had a kind of unusual affect, and he was kind of peculiar in his, um, in his speech and the things that he would perseverate on. I remember going home one night, taking the bus with somebody that else had worked in the office. And I remember she was just saying how weird he was and how odd he was. And, and I just remember turning to her and saying, well, don't you know, he has autism. <laughs> That's why he, he is that way. It didn't occur to her that he had autism. And I could see clearly because of my experience with my brother. He was very perseverant about things. He, he was very smart. He's very capable. But some of his uh, social habits were kind of peculiar. And in this particular job, he was very good. He was in charge of sorting information and he didn't really have to interface too much with the public, but he was quite effective at this particular job. But I just thought it was, it was so interesting that here's a gentleman that you know found his way, fortunately. But with that said, people were viewing him as just kind of an oddball. And it's not just because he was odd, he definitely had autism. So that experience that I remember about that particular internship, I didn't really get much else out of it, but that I remember so clearly. Tell me a little bit about the family that you grew up in. I am the oldest of three boys. So it's myself, my brother Tom, and my brother Brendan. Brendan is the one that was diagnosed with uh, special needs. I was in about third grade when he was born, so uh, there's about a seven-year difference between he and I. A little while after he was born, um, he started to have um, some serious seizures and diagnosed with epilepsy. So that was kind of hard uh, at that age, being a seven-year-old senior baby brother, go through that. Fortunately, we ended up getting hooked up with a really great neurologist. And um, so he was really, really instrumental and helpful. You were seven when Brendan was born. Do you even remember, can you take yourself back to the emotions that you felt when you realized that something wasn't exactly right with your baby brother? Sure. I mean, definitely some vivid memories. I remember him seizing in his crib. And, uh, you know, that was a really, really scary thing to see and be part of because although he wasn't in pain going through it, it to see it in a, happen in a little baby is really kind of jarring and really scary. To say that the situation was difficult for everyone, and especially his parents, is an understatement. This is something you often hear in a family where there is a child with a disability. It's a team effort, but this is something I wasn't expecting. So the neurologist that he went to see had asked us to videotape the seizures when they occurred. My role being that I was, a, as a kid at the time, I was at home with my mom and, and, and Brendan and my dad being at work, he couldn't videotape the seizures during the day. So it was my job to videotape them while my mom was kind of comforting them. And if you think back to those old school video cameras, like really big, but I just remember like the only thing I could do to help him. And I remember kind of thinking that way, like that's the only thing I can do to help him because I could, you can't really console him during these seizures and make me feel better that I could, I could do that and be, you know, helpful in that way. So that's one memory that I have like very, very clearly 
of that time period. Did there ever come a time, Brian, when your parents sat you down and your brother, your younger brother, and said, this is what's going on with Brendan? You know, I don't recall a, a, a big sit down per se, but my parents were always good about kind of keeping us in the loop on what was going on. So it was kind of like a, maybe a rolling conversation. Tom and I knew Brendan had to go into the hospital for, for whatever reason. Obviously, that wasn't something that we were, you know, kept kept in the dark about. His first year or so, we didn't have the opportunity to go many places because he, he needed so much attention and my parents needed to take time from work to, you know, take care of him. Like I said, kind of an all hands on deck kind of time period. However, I think it was more of kind of just a natural part of the conversation, part of dinner time. Dinner for all of us is a time where we eat, but we also talk with our friends or family. We talk about our day, experiences, and sometimes current events. At the Connolly household, things were not much different, except when they were. Like I was saying with that ketogenic diet, it became part of every mealtime routine. It was that, you know, Brendan's food had to get measured and all this heavy cream had to be put into his drinks and kind of like really gross to look at. <laughs> so like that is something that you kind of remember, but like, it's, it's always the elephant in the room that's it's right there um, as part of, of what was going on. Yep, the ketogenic diet, the popular diet that promises you'll shed the unwanted pounds. If you don't know, the ketogenic diet was developed by science to treat epilepsy. What do you think was the hardest part for your parents in those early years? I don't think I, I've asked them that. I would just imagine now putting myself in their position as a parent myself, doing all the other things that you need to do, going to work, maintaining your job, taking care of the other kids, on top of which having these huge challenges with one of your children. So I would imagine kind of like keeping it all together was the biggest struggle for them, you know, in that, in that regard. They did a great job. I don't feel like we were neglected in any way. We weren't overlooked. The 1980s wasn't that long ago at least for those of us who were alive during that decade. If you compare the world today to back then, things have changed a lot. Some people might believe that those were the days. Some would say life wasn't as easy back then. For families of children with disabilities, it likely wasn't. It still isn't. It was a different time period 30 years ago, so there wasn't as much information readily available. There wasn't the internet, <laughs> you know, you couldn't just Google, you had to read books, you had to go to the library, you had to go to the doctor. The, so, and then on top of which, you know, some of the things that we were going through were probably lesser known. Being, or at least feeling responsible for a sibling with a disability is a reality for adult siblings. In some families, it's not really discussed. I asked Brian how his family broached the subject. When did you realize that he was potentially going to be your responsibility someday? Was it a conversation that your parents had with you or was it something that you always knew? I would have to say something that I always knew. We just have those conversations. So I don't think it was necessarily ever a time where they sat me down and said, okay, Brian, I need you to consider this down the road. It just kind of was one of those things that was always talked about. Do you feel like having Brendan with special needs made you grow up faster? Yes, I think definitely informed uh, a lot of my upbringing from that point on, because once you have a brother or sister with special needs, it does become, become part of who you are. What have you learned about how the outside world views disabled people from having a brother with a disability? There's a, just a lack of knowledge. Probably that's the best way to put it. There's a lack of understanding. Um, there might be sympathy. There might be empathy but you don't know what you don't know. Which is one of the reasons why I started this podcast. I then asked Brian a series of questions about Brendan today, and this is what he told me. He got a college degree. He recently moved to North Carolina with my parents, and he has a good social network down there. He has a part-time job. He, he writes a little bit, picked up photography. You know, I think that's been gratifying and satisfying to see him you know, in that projection, because knowing from where he came from to where he is now, I think that's great. Uh, similarly, what do you think has been the biggest lesson he's taught you? The biggest lesson is we all learn differently and we all handle the world a little bit differently. You got to find what works for you. So even if you don't have a, 
a special circumstance or a disability. The world is tough. And sometimes you have to do some things that works for you, you know, might not work for somebody else. We all should have goals that are centered towards us. So segueing into your adult life, Brendan influence in any way your career path? Yes. My career path, I've been working in disability services for almost 20 years now. I cannot say that there was a moment where I said, you know what, I'm going to do this for my career because of Brendan. However, certainly having him as a brother exposed me to that career path then in a way that I probably wouldn't have been exposed to it. I saw ABC charts early on, and, and that's a, a, the behavioral chart. I saw his IEP early on. I went to his school. I went to his classes. I, it opened up the, that kind of avenue is that maybe this is something I could do. My first job out of college was a, I was a TA in a special education classroom in, in a high school. I loved it. I just I like really enjoyed it. So my career has kind of gone from there. What is a disability services professional? There may be people who don't know what that means. It could mean a number of things. Disability services to me is a wide range of services. Obviously, someone that is diagnosed with a disability, a long-term disability. For adults, we're talking about rehabilitation programs. We're talking about pre-vocational programs. So getting someone ready for work. Then there's programs, supported employment programs. So supporting someone at a job in the community. There's job coaching there, helping them find a job, interview, getting them placed. They can be great programs. I've seen some bad programs. Unfortunately, less people know about them than even your kind of special ed model. People kind of understand early intervention, the need for special education, but there's also kind of a, a misnomer where not everyone realizes that services can be needed or after high school. So once a person is an adult, if you have a special need, it, it's tough to navigate the world on your own. There are programs that are out there, and some states are better than others. But with that said, adult services is kind of like a lesser known industry. When you say dehabilitation, can you just define what that means? Dehab program is kind of like a school. It's a little bit of a hybrid. So it's a little bit of a school, a little bit of a healthcare provider for those with special needs that have medical concerns. They're largely community-based programs. So meaning that at least 50% of the time, the individual that attends the program, whether they attend one day a week or five days a week, they're going out into the community. So what some of those outings can be anywhere from, you know, going to the park, going to the mall, um, taking college classes, uh, it can be really kind of a wide range of things. And the challenge for those programs is, of course, obviously funding, staffing, you know, that, those kind of logistics. But one thing about those programs that people don't really consider until you do it is that they're really long-term relationships between the person and the, and the program. So it can be five days a week, year-round, for decades. The challenge for the person in the program, the challenge for the program itself is to always keep it, always reinvent it yourself and to find things that are meaningful, therapeutic, because it, things can get stale. And so it's an interesting field, but it's, it can be very challenging in that regard. Knowing what you know, how can a parent best prepare their child and how can they best prepare themselves? So first I would say parents are by nature always see the best in their kids, right? You got to check that at certain times when you're talking about your son or daughter with special needs. And the one time to check that is when you are first applying for services. Brian talked a lot about the funding for each adult with a disability. And I don't think people realize why it's so important. He goes on to explain how it works in New Jersey. It may be similar wherever you live. So in New Jersey, just an example, funding goes from a, B, C, D, all the way down to, to E. That means you need less support. You have less funding tied to you, okay? So you nat as a parent, you naturally want to, like, well, my, student, my son is an A student, right? He doesn't really need that much help. That's the wrong kind of thinking when you're applying for funding. There's different models in New York, but it's the same kind of idea. It's upfront, when you're filling out that paperwork, you want to be as honest as you can be with yourself. And you want to kind of envision your son or daughter being alone in the house for a period of time when you're checking those boxes. But can 
Timmy really cook the meal by himself or does he need support? Does he need help getting dressed? You want to kind of view it in, a, in not the best light. And, and that's really hard for parents to put in their head because it, it, I've seen it time and time and time before where, you know, so-and-so is great. Yeah, they're great. They're great. And then you get into a situation where their funding tier is inappropriate. So they do need more supervision. They might need a one-to-one. -one. Well, you're not going to get a one-to-one -one if you're a funding tier A, as I gave an example, right? So not put the love goggles on. You want to be really, really honest. Two words I didn't expect, love goggles, but it fits. We all at one time or another have wanted to see what we wanted to see through rose-colored glasses. Basically, that parents should endeavor to look at their children for who they really are. Right, and what they really need. It's okay to ask for help. It's not a failure in your parenting. It's not a failure in the school that your son or daughter might need physical therapy after age 21 or speech therapy or a one-to-one -one example. Once again, the more honest you are with those, those initial documents up front, the better shot you have is getting those services. And then if you get approved for those services and you don't really use them, that's okay too. But it's better to have them than not have them. Brian also goes on to offer really solid advice about how parents should view the entire application process. The thing too is the parents don't understand is like, you're never going to go to a party and then someone's going to say, you're like, oh, Timmy is not a level A? No, no, he needs to be a level A. No one cares. No one and the outside world knows about that. So it's just paperwork. I would just understand that first. There are no widely available statistics that tell us the percentage or number of adult siblings who are caretakers for a sibling with a disability. However, in 2012, Easter Seals conducted a poll of 351 siblings of an adult with a disability. 23% of them were currently primary caregivers. One in three expected to become caregivers in the future. That's half or 50%. What would you say to the sibling of a person with a disability? What are the things that you think they need to think about and confront as they get older and face the possibility of having to take care or watch over a sibling? Same question to the sibling is to the parents. What's the plan? What's the, what's the future going to look like when mom and dad can't make those decisions and take care of Timmy anymore? What's your role going to be? And what do you want it to be? There's also a, a movement within the disability community to include siblings. Just a little bit of a plug for the national nonprofit, uh, the Sibling Leadership Network gives a lot of good information, advocacy. They have conferences. You know, it's good for if you have a, your sibling just to learn more about what's going on, what's the trends, um, because what is going on now is going to be different in 30 years. I don't know what, what it will be like. So I think it's always good to stay up on trends. And those of you with siblings likely know this to be true. The great thing about siblings is like they're going to put you in your place. There's definitely a benefit to having a sibling involved in that conversation naturally. Siblings do add a little uh, spice in ways that parents you know, are just not geared to it, right? Like I see it with my kids. They push each other because like that's what siblings do, right? And I think that's good, a good element in team meetings. Finding current statistics was a bit difficult, but numbers released by the National Center for Educational Statistics for the 2015-2016 academic year reported that 19% of college students identified as disabled. In another study, it reported that 11% of college students identified as disabled. And of those, 41% graduated from a two-year program, while only one-third graduated from a four-year undergraduate institution. One of the things that has personally interested me is the access of disabled people to higher education. How successful is that? Or better yet, better put, I think, is how difficult is entry? I would say I would be the most optimistic about that area for a lot of different reasons. I see it more and more programs popping up at colleges, independent programs, companies that kind of cater to this. Colleges are at their heart schools, right? And they're equipped 
to make accommodations for students that need support at, at all levels, right? So it might not be Down syndrome, but it might be a learning disability. It might be health, mental health issues. I think schools are caught on that students have wide ranges of needs and you have to address them. That is a good thing. And I see that more and more. I want to give a little bit of context to the next question I asked Brian, just to remove any potential confusion. Most of us should know that disabilities are varied in nature and severity. We all know people with a disability who are high functioning and independent. They've obtained college degrees and many have advanced degrees. I have a particular interest in the development of individuals with intellectual disabilities who in my experience are often left behind in higher learning. Clemson Life is a two-year program at Clemson University in South Carolina. It's a program that allows young people with developmental disabilities for example, Down syndrome, to have a college-like experience. They live on campus, participate in functional academic classes, which is a fancy way of saying that they are classes that are geared towards them and how to live in the real world. They learn independent living skills and also are prepared for employment. Like many of us in college, they also socialize with their peers. I don't know how much you know about Clemson. Clemson University is down south, and I know that they have a program called Clemson Life. I follow them on Instagram because I love watching the students live in the dorms, go to classes. Is there anything analogous up north? Because I think their program is very unique. I'll check out the Clemson program too. There are like many of these programs popping up kind of all across the country. Give a little bit of a shout out to a little company called the Successful Learning Center. Early on in my career, we were taking classes at the local community college and we would take a group over and they would audit a class. And what ended up happening was that there's only so many classes they could audit. A bunch of these professors over at RCC, the community college we were going to, saw that there was this need 6.5 million people in the U.S. have an intellectual disability. The last available statistic from 2017 found that 17.8% of children in the U.S. are diagnosed with an intellectual disability and that these numbers are increasing. Over the years, last decade or so, it's expanded, exploded. They have programming in Rockland County, Westchester County, and Orange County. They have affiliations with PACE and Fordham. Although they're not teaching a Fordham class, PACE class, they'll lease space and they've connected with the students at PACE, students that maybe are studying special education. It's not exactly like the Clemson program, but it's a nice little program and it's really, really successful. Just the growth of it just shows the potential in this particular area. To drive the point home even more, I talked to Brian about Ruby's Rainbow. If you have an opportunity, learn more about what this wonderful woman is doing for young people with intellectual disabilities. She raised well over $356,000. This money will allow the organization to award 71 scholarships and counting to deserving young people. Ruby's rainbow. Ruby is the founder's daughter and Ruby has Down syndrome. She started a scholarship fund so that young people with Down syndrome could go to university or they could go to these certificate programs that are part of the university system. Every single year, she raises more and more money. So the fact that there's such an outpouring of support tells me that there is a need. And I think the need is coming from the families of these young people and from the young people themselves. Of course, it makes sense to create opportunities for them to take part in it. Do you think that the world treats disabled people differently depending on the type of disability they have? Like, obviously, there are disabilities. The outside world immediately knows that person is, quote unquote, different. And there are other disabilities that people can't see. Which one do you think is most difficult? Well, I guess there's different challenges to both. For someone that the disability is apparent, someone that has Down syndrome or maybe uh, cerebral palsy, something that you know is there. I think for that person, that the challenge is to get the person on the other side to see beyond that disability because the disability comes right out front. So that's its own you know, challenge and conversation. On the flip side, in the invisible disability, so to speak, or that's not so apparent, that leads us to a different 
set of challenges. There's kind of a, a distrust sometimes where is this person really disabled or why are they acting this way? Or, and it adds to a whole other set of challenges. The statistics on invisible disability are all over the place and nowhere. 96% of chronic medical conditions have no outward signs. And most aren't disabling. 10% of people with chronic medical conditions experience symptoms that are considered disabling. According to a 2017 study by the Center for Talent Innovation, among white-collar, college-educated employees, now that's an important distinction to remember, 30% have a disability, but only 3.2% self-identified as having a disability to their employers. Of all the employees with a disability, 62% had an invisible one. What do you think is the biggest challenge that disabled people face in general in our society? I would say probably the first thing that comes to mind is, say, two things, two, uh, lack of awareness and then lack of funding, you know, for someone that needs a certain kind of accommodation. That's not always present, especially for adults, especially if they want to enter the work world. We definitely have gotten better over the last 25, 30 years. It's ADA. The ADA, in case you're unfamiliar, is the Americans with Disabilities Act, which passed in 1990. It prohibits discrimination based on disability. It will turn 30 years old this July. Reasonable accommodations are something that is more commonplace and accepted in traditional HR departments in the worst world. However, there's still a ways to go. There's a big movement to have more neurodiversity at work. There's more of an understanding or a push or an advocacy to have workers that are on the spectrum be considered or prudent. And that's a great thing to see. Families that transition out of special education, meaning that you know when their son or daughter turns 21, graduates from school, it's a hard transition. As much as schools try to ready them, it's really hard to know that their son had a one-on-one -on -one in school that's not necessarily guaranteed for the rest of their life. Someone who has an aging brother or sister with special needs. Like anybody else, your needs change. As someone gets older, your medical needs change and, and develop. Having worked in this industry for almost 20 years, what changes do you want to see happen? We need a clearer roadmap, especially for employment first. So I'm meaning that the goal of every person with an ISP, Individual Service Plan, is to get a job in the community. There's really not a clear roadmap for providers like where I work, families, and for the people to get there. Sheltered workshops, which had been part of our, our industry for so many years, those programs have been closing. Um, so they're, they're kind of dinosaurs of the past. But once again, what's missing is there's no clear roadmap for, to get us from point A to point B. Brian just used the term sheltered workshops, and it's quite possible that a lot of you have no idea what that means. Sheltered workshops, in a nutshell, were workshops that were started by organizations that hired people with disabilities, intellectual and developmental specifically, to work at simple tasks, and they work separately from the general population. The practice started decades ago, and originally, it was seen as an opportunity to give vocational experience to people within these communities. When they started, opportunities in the real world were very limited. Unlike the workers in the general population, the workers at the sheltered workshops are paid far less than minimum wage. Brian then goes into some detail. On the flip side of that is that you have people that were working in, in places like that for, once again, decades. We're getting paychecks that were like sometimes less than a dollar, but they were working, right? And then, and they were safe for the most part. Like it was a full-time nurse. The people that went there got dropped off by a bus. They had staff to help them do their job. They had a nice Christmas party every year. In a lot of ways, it was kind of an extension for school from them. Payday was a big day. I got a paycheck. It's a $3 and 75 cents. I mean, I understand how the outside world says, Hey, that's, that's disgusting. It's just that the, the person that was making that $3.75, the state is now saying is that they should be working as a barista at Starbucks. That's a big jump, you know? <laughs> you know? So they were working or not working um, in, a, uh, in, a, in a workshop, and now 
they have to go out into the competitive workforce. That's a big jump. I think there's a, a need for better, just a better bridge to get that person to that spot. And understanding that uh, not everyone's going to get there, but there has to be better programming to at least try to get them there. What is the most challenging aspect or aspects? I mean, I don't even know if you could narrow it down to just one thing about the work that you do. It's the funding for it and supporting a family and making a career out of it. You know, that's that's a challenge for a lot of people that enter this kind of field. And it drives a lot of people away from the field. I can tell you that. The other challenge of it would be just, once again, the long-term nature of it. People don't really realize how long a look that is. You know, a teacher can have a challenging student for a year, take a summer off, and then have another set of uh, different students. When you're working with in the adult population, often you're talking about a commitment to that person that could be, once again, decades, decades. So that's a long time. People go up and down and have good, good months and good years. Stagnation is part of life, you know, and, and that happens to you and I that you kind of have times where you start to plateau on something that's not out there as part of the conversation in terms of people with disabilities. Do you think that there's fatigue? Absolutely. And, and fatigue for the, the worker and then also the person and the family. I can't tell you how frustrating it is for families to deal with staff turnover. Staff turnover is a real problem in disability services. And once again, I'm specifically talking about adult services. It's tough to make a living in, in this field. For the person that gets connected to their teacher and their day have program, but the teacher finishes her master's degree and then goes and does something else, that's hard. And that's hard for the family too, because they start to feel like they have, they have a, a bit of a rapport, a trust with a house manager um, at so-and-so's group home and the house manager leaves. And that's hard. It's also normal because once again, I just go back to the other thing that really gets talked about is the long-term commitment that these programs and the individuals have. You know, If your house manager is there for 10 years, that's a long time to work in this field. Almost unusual to have someone work that long. But with that said, 10 years is maybe one quarter of the time that person might be in that group home. person might be living in that group home for 20, 30, 40 years. There's going to be naturally staff turnovers. So trying to turn on a positive note, what is the thing that you like the most about what you do? What is it that gets you up in the morning to go? I just really like characters and personalities. The quirkier, the better. And this, you know, it's nice to kind of, the nice thing about working in human services, you do get to meet people, right? And you do get to meet people that are going to often inspire you, but also just make you laugh and you just enjoy them. And then building things that, that, that last, the, the things that are cool to say that I've done. It was really awesome to be part of programming where you're doing something that you know that really hasn't been done before or hasn't been tried. So that always is stuff that is exciting because that's something you can take with you. I've had success with our day programs where we had people with disabilities rowing in a boat. That was just cool. It's just something that not other programs were doing. To see that kind of thing happen as an example or you know, to make a really good partnership where our groups are working hand in hand with other volunteers in the community where they like legitimately need our help. They would foster relationships to see that kind of stuff happen. Um, that is the kind of stuff you say, oh, hey, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. When you're working on a grant and to get some adaptive equipment, and then you see that person use that walker or a standing table, it makes you feel good. That's the kind of stuff that I would say that brings you back for more. The reason I started laughing at the next question was because one, it was unplanned. And two, this particular phrase can sometimes be overused. But in this case, it's actually true. Do you think it takes a village to raise a child with a disability? Yeah, I know. That's, that's, that phrase uh, definitely is applicable, for sure. To raise the child, for sure. And then to continue on in life. And we can't, we can't be on an island all by ourselves. Some people need a bigger support network, but you need a support network. But it's super important if you a person with disability to make sure your support network or your village is a really good one. You want to live in a good village. You know, if you live in a bad one, things are just going to be much more challenging for you. 
To end the interview, I asked Brian one question. The answer was at once touching, funny, and very real. And it's something we should all take to heart and carry with us every single day. What's at least one thing that you would want a non-disabled person to know about disabled people? They're a person that has a disability, but they are a person. They are an adult. They are going to have ups and downs. They might want to get married. They might also be jerks. <laughs> it's okay to say that. You know, <laughs> you know? like just because you have a disability doesn't make you a really good person. They are a person, right? They are people. They can be racist. They can be nice because they are people. With that said, they can be wonderful just like any other person, right? They can be super smart in their own way, or they might have skills that are sets them apart. Just like anybody else, they're just not a person with a disability. They, they are a person. I just want to thank Brian for allowing me to interview him. When I told him I was starting a podcast and why I wanted him to guest, he enthusiastically accepted the invitation. I'm absolutely grateful that he trusted me to do this. I got to know a different side of him, and I confirmed what I always knew. My friend married a good man. I also learned way more about the work he has dedicated himself to for close to two decades. It's noble, but difficult. It has rewarding outcomes, but challenging circumstances along the way. People with developmental and intellectual disabilities deserve a chance in life. We should support them and those like Brian who fight to get them there. If you subscribe to my newsletter, you should have or will receive the transcript of this interview resources provided by Brian, as well as his contact information if you'd like to follow up with him. As I close an episode, I would like to acknowledge a lovely young man named Adam Galchis and his family band, The Waffles, for my wonderful theme music. Not only is Adam musically talented, but he has a story all his own. I'm excited for you to hear it in his own words in season one. I'd also like to thank the duo at Sonorous Lab for their expert sound design and engineering. If you'd like to learn more about the podcast, I invite you to go to agingwiselypodcast.com, look around, and subscribe to my newsletter. Every two weeks, a new episode, news you can use, and resources, not to mention the episode transcript, are delivered to your inbox. If you'd like to leave a voicemail for me to listen to and possibly include in a future episode, please call 347-378-7973. Lastly, if you haven't subscribed to my podcast, I would love it if you do. And if you love my podcast, please tell others. It would mean a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you.